Father, you have done great things. You are great, God. Man, there's only one that is good, and that's you. And so, God, we look to you today. Fill our hearts, God. Give us understanding, Father. If there's something that holds us back to what you have for us and want, God, with us and in our lives, and for us to know today, God, would you, by your Spirit now, come and remove those things. Set them aside, God, as we focus on you. We love you, God. Father, we love you. Be blessed in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. What a great worship set this morning. Awesome. And God has done great things, hasn't he? I missed it because I wasn't here. I was guest teaching at other churches. Um, Calvary Fort Collins greets you. Uh, Calvary Truth Church Calvary greets you as well. Um, our family and the Lord, such wonderful people. Uh, but I missed it last, uh, it was like last week or the week before. The end of September um, was the anniversary of when I got saved. And so I think back at, you know, what does get saved? Well, that's when I received Jesus. I mean, it's easy as that. I grew up knowing God. I mean, my, my mom talked about God and, you know, we went to church. We were CEO Christians, you know, Christmas, Easter, and other holidays, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we were the CEOs at our church and we, I, I knew, it's Siri, of course you didn't catch that. Get saved. Um, <laughs> I knew about God, but I didn't know Him. And I remember it was just 14 years ago that I gave my life to the Lord. And 10 years out of the last 14, I've been pastoring. Um, and so that's why I'm such a mess. There you go. Now you know. Uh, but I look at back at um, the 14 years of being with the Lord and all that He has done. All that He has done. He's done so much in such a small amount of time. And I tell you, if you give God a month, He'll do more than you could do for yourself in a lifetime. He'll do more in your heart. He has done great things. I'm so thankful to be back with you today. Today we start something quite different. Um, I have been going verse by verse through 1 Corinthians, and we will continue that verse by verse study. Uh, but we're going to take a break and do a very short series on marriage. All right, We've never done a series in this church that I can remember. We've gone verse by verse since we started this church in 2011. Uh, but the Lord had put this on my heart because I've been doing a lot of premarital counseling lately. I mean like six couples um, in the past just couple months here. Um, and now starting with two more. Uh, and so it, it's interesting have the, as the conversations have unfolded how important... Uh, how important it is uh, to talk about these things, especially us as a church, for me to impart these things to you. Now, here's the thing about today and about probably the next two weeks. Um, well, the next two weeks, I'm actually, my, my family and I are on vacation, uh, but the two weeks after I get back, um, it, these, these teachings are not meant to condemn. They're not meant to offend you in any way. And the reason I say that is because I'm going to teach the Bible. I'm going to give you truth. Um, I'm going to put the example of Jesus Christ out there, and I'm going to talk through hard topics such as divorce um, and, and situations that you may have been through, you might be going through right now. Um, and some of these things that I'm going to talk about, I will address the effect of divorce on society, the effect of divorce on the house and on the home. These things are not meant to cause any stir in your heart to the fact that you've done, you know, you're, you're too far gone or something's happened and you're bad and God's not with you. That's not it at all. Um, I'll, I'm going to give you this. If I tell you that the Bible says husbands love your wives and yet you're divorced, love your wife. Love her now. Start right now. We say, well, I went, I, I, I lived with her 25 years and I never loved her unconditionally. Start now. But I'm not married to her anymore. Start now. Receive Jesus, receive Christ, receive the spirit of peace, freedom, love, receive that and walk in it now. And so, so I'm not giving you, I, I, I'm trying to kind of inoculate you a little bit because my intention is not to hurt in any way. The enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy. My intention is to equip you to give you correct information, to tell you what the Bible says. Cause I tell you what the history channel does not tell you what the Bible says. They tell you what will sell. They give you a story that has pieces of biblical literature in it, but it's not the Bible, okay? And the world will tell you things that they call truth, but it's not truth. And its pathway leads to destruction. And that's not, that's not, my job is not to do that. My job is to not lead you in any way to destruction or lead you to a dead end. My job is to make sure we all get home safely. And my job is to make sure this is a church that teaches the word of God in the last days. Um, and so... With that being said, as I enter into a series on marriage, what I consider to be a very important, if not primary, uh, in the church, keep that in mind. And if you start to feel condemned, remember, there is no condemnation 
to those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8. There's no condemnation. You and I need to take the reflection of the Word of God and use it effectively as a mirror because that's what it is. And we go away and we install the truths and graces of God equally because the grace of God is for you. Where you're at right now, no matter what you've been through or what you've done or how many times you've been married or what you're going through right now with your wife or with your husband, I want you to know that you are 100% acceptable to God just as you are through Jesus Christ. God's grace is for you. God's grace is upon you. Cannot be taken away. The callings and graces and blessings of God are irrevocable, the Bible says. And so through Jesus, you have a place with him. So do not let the enemy, because the enemy, number one, wants to attack you in this area of marriage. Number one, I'll talk about why. I'm going to give you some truths that will blow your mind. Say, I'm going to give you the reason why Satan attacks marriages. There is absolute reason. Um, and so I'll give that to you. But as he does that, even through this series that we are in, I want you to stay the course. Stay the course and know that God is for you. All right? Are we okay? Yes. Yes. All right, I'm going to have to stop about halfway through this and go, are we okay? <laughs> <laughs> It's estimated that there have been over a hundred million songs written about love. Over a hundred million. You say, that doesn't sound like too much. You got a hundred million dollars? <laughs> it sounds like a lot then, doesn't it? hundred million. Out of the 1.1 million feature films, short films, and made-for-TV movies, the majority of them are about love. This is a topic, love, the topic of marriage, is in, it infiltrates our culture. In fact, all of you are here, <laughs> never mind. Half of all adult-aged Americans, half of all adult-aged Americans today are married, half of all. There's an estimated 100 billion jokes <laughs> about marriages, wives and husbands. Okay, that's probably just my estimate. But, of course, I've brought you one to start us with today. A woman was caught shoplifting at the grocery store, had to go to court. Her loving husband, of course, went with her to be by her side, and the judge asked her, what are you here for? Shoplifting, what did you steal? She said, I stole a can of pears. He said, why? Well, I was hungry. The judge looked puzzled for a moment and asked, how many pears were in the can? The lady said, well, there were six. Thinking for a minute, the judge says, well, I'm going to make an example out of you. I'm going to send it to you to one year for every pear. That's six years. The wife was mortified, stunned. The husband stood for a moment with her, raised her hand. She breathed an exhale of relief, knowing that he would reason with the judge. And he said, Your Honor. She said, Yes, sir. He said, She also stole a can of peas. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. See, it's funny. It's funny. That's a funny joke because we got problems, we got issues. When God brings two people together, he brings two broken people together into a marriage. It doesn't make, it's interesting, two broken people don't make one right. It's your relationship with the Lord that's pushing you that way, not your marriage. We just finished, well, a couple weeks back because I've been at other churches, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as we're going verse by verse through 1 Corinthians, which is the chapter that puts on blast, puts on display. It's the sounding, the manifestation of the more excellent way. Remember all the gifts, all the manifestations of the Spirit that Paul said there in the church of Corinth was all over the place in their exaggeration of the gifts of the Spirit. And yet he said, I show you a more excellent way, more excellent than anything that's ever been created, anything that's even knowable to man, and that is a Agapeo. Agapeo is the Greek word for unconditional love. Unconditional, without condition. This is gift love. This is love that has to have strength behind it, grit with it, courage alongside of it. It is absolutely selfless, and that is put on display for us in that chapter. Hopefully you remember 1 Corinthians 13, or if you've read through it on your own. If you truly, that chapter tells us that if you truly do love someone, listen to me, the way that God loves you, I am so thankful that God has this agape, uh, unconditional love for me. How about you? Yes. I haven't had a perfect day yet in my life. And God still loves me through every bit of it. And that is the way that God loves me. And I'm like, man, if I've received it, then I ought to give it. And that's even the commandment of God. And so if you're loving someone the way that God loves you, the way that God has commanded you to love others, then with them and for them, your love is, as 1 Corinthians 13 says, patient. It's patient. I have an issue with patience. Do you? 
Every bit of this will go against your flesh, by the way, because you're meant to be powered from on high. You can't be powered from inside your chest for this stuff. This is power from God. Your love is meant to be patient. I ain't got that on my own, okay? But through God, I do have that. Through the indwelling presence of His Holy Spirit, I have that. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love doesn't seek its own. You see, that's the kind of love you have for them and with them. Man, this is primary in the home. No matter what the worldly circumstance turns out to be, love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, bears all things, and in the long run it never fails. Which means God's love for me is unstoppable. People have this feeling that if I mess up that God doesn't love you anymore. Are you out of your mind? You've got to understand what grace is. Somebody has lied to you, and his name is Satan. He has lied to you that if you have a bad day, God doesn't love you any less today than he did yesterday. He loves me on my worst day just as he does on my best day. Do you understand? And it is without ceasing. It is unstoppable. There is no expiration and there is no deterrence to the kind of love that God loves you with. And yet so few find the strength, the grit to press into God to give that love away, to give it to others. Man, maybe we feel like if we give it away, we won't have it anymore. Maybe that's what it is. If I I give it away, then I won't have it anymore. But the interesting thing is the more you give away, the more you get. The more you receive, the more God pours it on you. It's interesting. This kind of love between God and mankind, this agape o love, bilateral, okay? It's not just the way that God loves me. It's the way that I ought to love God as well. And here we have an issue, don't we, America? Because as soon as God doesn't, start to, doesn't continue to bless us, we start feeling like, well, I can't get with Him anymore. But that's not loving God at all. This has a purity factor. This love... This is why it's a target. This is why we've got to talk about this in the relationship in the confines of, of marriage. And if you're not married today, think about this. It, it, this is how, if you're, the kind of friend you are is going to be the kind of husband you'll be. Don't think that you're going to like become some sort of super husband as soon as you get saved. The kind of uh, employee you are is the kind of wife you will become. The kind of employee you are is the kind of husband you will become. It's not like you change, or you ought not to change, and if you do change, it doesn't last very long. If I come to church and try to be a different Matt than I am at work, how long is that going to last? Especially because I'm hiring y'all. <laughs> I'm building, I'm bringing more people into my workplace, and so y'all see me 24-7, some of y'all. You know, it, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work very long that way if you try it. There is a purity factor in love that predates sin. Okay? You need to think about these things and we need to consider these. Agape o bilateral love between God and man, man and God, was before the fall. It was before sin. And what is equally as important to mention is that so does marriage. Marriage predates sin. Now think about it for a minute. Adam was brought to Eve and they came together before the fall. And so there's this originality to marriage. There is an originality to love that predates the fall, predates sin. God instituted it all, love and marriage, before the fall. It is therefore the original. It is therefore the original design that God would know man, man would know God, and that man and wife would come together. It is original. And therefore, marriage is the original target of Satan. Marriage is the original target. Now you can start to see why it's so hard. Why the flesh and the world and Satan are so against marriage. Because it predates all of them. It's like their big brother. It's like, you know, it's like sibling rivalry. I hate you. You're better than me, you know. When you put them together, check this out. When you put agape o love the relationship between God and man and man and God, and you put marriage, the relationship between man and wife and wife and man, if you put them together, now you have number one on Satan's hit list. Number one. A marriage that has agape o makes him barf. Satanic barf. <laughs> you know, I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it looks like, but it's, it's bad. I want you to know, we, we all... There is no marriage. We all have issues, okay? Every marriage has problems. But as you walk with the Lord, as you walk with the Lord, okay? Because the enemy, if you walk with him, good luck in your marriage. But as you walk with the Lord, 
Sanctification. That's the process. Listen, you can't be sanctified. Sanctified means to be set apart, to be called out, to be, to be made genuine, to be made extremely valuable. That sanctification process can't happen unless you're a Christian. You're not a Christian unless you're saved. Being saved means you've been born again, which means God has reversed the sin process in your heart all the way down to a baby, and you're growing up again. I'm a 14-year-old. About to get my license. You know, no, no. Then y'all are in trouble. You're growing up in the things of the Lord. You have to be a Christian to do that. Sanctification, growing up in the things of the Lord, has, and, and boy, has April and I seen this in our marriage. Sanctification has a reversing effect of the fall in your heart, your life, and your marriage. It's Romans 12, 1, where we start this morning. In Romans chapter 12, this is very familiar to many folks that have been in the Bible for some time, but Romans 12, chapter 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be, here's the sanctification, do not be conformed to this world, but walk with God. Don't be conformed, don't walk with the world, don't walk with the enemy. Walk with God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I love what Tony Evans once explained. I really do love this. Um, I am uh, constantly, almost constantly, over the last 10 years, uh, um, being called upon for uh, coming alongside of people, giving them godly advice and counsel, helping them through situations, especially with their spouses. Um, and usually I'm just patching cracks in their walls. Tony Evans says it like this. He had a crack manifest in his wall once, in the plaster of the wall. And he called a painter over. And the painter took a look at it and said, no problem. I'll get that fixed right up for you. Fixed it right up. Looked great. About a month later, crack came back. And so he called the same painter and he said, hey, uh, you know, this crack is back. And so uh, <laughs> the crack is back. It sounds weird. The crack came back and, uh, and the painter said, okay, I'm so sorry about that. Let me take care of it. Boom. Fixed it right on up. Uh, about a month later, the crack came back, but this time it's spreading. This time it's spidering out. And he said, obviously I got the wrong painter. And so he called a different painter. This different painter came out um, and he was looking at the crack on the wall and he was studying it and he was looking at the, the spider web, you know, that's coming out of it, looking at it for a while. He goes back to him. He says, sorry, I can't fix your problem. And Tony goes, what are you talking about? You can't fix my problem. You're a painter. This is what you do. He goes, no, I can't fix that problem. And nobody can fix it. You see, your issue is not the wall. Your issue is your foundation. Until your foundation stops moving or you fortify your foundation, all you're going to do for the rest of your life of living in this house, all you're going to do is patch those wall cracks and they're going to come back. They're going to continue to come. And see, that's it. If you don't fix the foundation that keeps shifting, and that foundation is agape o love. That foundation is your relationship. Listen, I can't patch up my behaviors as a husband. I need to address the foundation. I'm not after this behavioral correction. I'm after root cause correction. And so until you get to the foundation of the problem, it doesn't matter who you're married to, how much money you have, how good it is, what a good wife she is, or what a good husband he is, you're going to always be patching cracks on your wall until you fix the primary foundation. And that primary foundation is your walk with the Lord your walk with the Lord. You know, I always ask people that are in premarital with me, I say, what is the number one thing you need from your husband? And I ask them to send this to me and, you, and to send it to me separate from each other. I want to know the number one and five things you need from your future wife and five things you need from your future husband. And I ask them to send that to me before we meet. Um, and without a doubt, I always get love, support, encouragement, you know, credit card. <laughs> you know, I, I always, I get some funny ones, but then I always, and I guess, you know, you two that are starting premarital with me soon are going to get this already. I always correct them immediately. No, the number one thing you need from your wife is that she grows in her walk with the Lord. That's the number one thing you need from your wife. And the number one thing you need from your husband is for him to be close to the Lord and to grow in his walk with the Lord. That's the number one thing you need because that's the foundation from which everything else is going to flow. And primarily in marriage, that's where love is. The relationship between a man and his wife, a woman and her husband, that is the target bullseye where the enemy does not want love to reign. That's the number one place. The number one, if love is not reigning in your marriage, then he is having his way. Why is that? 
Now I'm going to get into some things that are going to be hard to take. And I, and I want to ask you to just receive this because it's true, although it's going to be hard to hear. I'm a product of divorce. It's interesting how many times I go through issues with uh, um, depression and um, you know, suicidal tendencies and wrath and uh, people that can't get on their feet. And I ask them about their past. I ask them about their parents. And they immediately start to cry. If the enemy can take out love in your marriage, if he can take out the parents, then he can harm the children. If he can destroy the family, that's, that's first dimension. If he can destroy the family, he will deal a death blow to the church. See, he's very strategic. The enemy is very, very, very smart. He has no wisdom, but he's extremely smart. He is an angel. He understands things outside the realm of humanity. And that's why we don't fight him with human means. We fight him through the Spirit. And Jesus indeed battles for us. But if he can take out the parents, he harms the children. If he can destroy the family, he deals a death blow to the church. If he deals a death blow to the church, then he gets the society. And now you can take us as a world from the year, I don't know, 1600. Chen, you were there. And you accelerate it to the year 2020. And look at the society, the global society that we live in today, where life is no longer in any way valued, where we have issues of crime, issues in the home, issues in the streets. We have issues nationally. We have a government that can't stop spitting at each other. And you say, well, where did all this come from? Exactly what I just said. Love in the family. The enemy having his way. I was at a movie this uh, past, uh, when did we go, Friday? When did we go, Friday? Friday night to a movie. We went to see Abominable. It was the uh, cartoon where the, the Yeti lives on the roof. Is it based on a true story? Um, it was good. It was good. But there was this kid next to me. He, he was three or four years old. And his mom committed the unpardonable sin. His mom gave him a Slurpee. They have those Slurpees at the... At the yeah, that's unpardonable. Okay. Because as soon as this three-year-old ran out of the ice stopped melting, it was... And I'm not talking about once, folks. The entire movie. And he would say, I think this kid's name was Jason or something. The mom was there, two boys on either side. And he would go... And I'm like... Eh, you know? And she would go, Jason! <laughs> Just keep watching the movie. Jason! Every time. And I'm like, uh, this is not going to, this is not, I'm, I don't like this at all. This is not going to, I don't get this. I don't understand this. But instead of correcting and disciplining her son, because my kid, he would have, that thing would have been snatched out of his hands so fast. And, and then I would have made him pay me for it. A big refund, you know? But she, every time, <laughs> Jason! Every time. So then I'm over here dying because I'm like, lady, your kid, that, that is, okay, you're going to bail him out later because how you're handling a Slurpee, number one. <laughs> number two, y'all know I'm right too. I don't know, one of you doesn't think I'm right. You have every right, to, every right to be wrong. Second thing is then he goes, <laughs> and he choked on it. <laughs> and me and my, you know, Christian agape of love, you know what I did, right? Mm. Mm. But we have, a, we have a full society now that laughs at the disobedience of their kids. We have a full world geopolitical system that rewards kids that think more of themselves than they do of their elders around them. And you wonder where all that came from. That came from the enemy. That comes from the enemy dealing a blow to the family, to the love, to the church, to the society. Malachi chapter 2, Malachi 2.16, um, it is the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi 2.16 I should have marked it. I don't have tabs. Malachi 2.16 says, For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. Hates it. But I thought he gave us outs. I thought we have outs in the Bible. Doesn't mean he doesn't hate it. I mean, he said Moses gave you a certificate of divorce because of the hardness of your hearts. But it wasn't so from the beginning. 
for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Two things I've got to point out here. The absence of love in the home, in the covenant of marriage, is a suit of violence for the family. The absence of love. And I'm not saying, well, yeah, I love her and she knows I love her. You need to start, you need to start bringing the love, husband. Creating the loving situation, wife. Creating it because the absence of it is like, you know Iron Man when he puts on the suit of armor? It's like putting on a suit of violence, the Bible says. We dress for our employment every day, don't we? We have things that we... If you work at Chick-fil-A, you wear your name tag, your shirt, and your my pleasure every day. If you work at State Farm, you wear khakis and a red polo, you know? You dress for where you work. You gear up if you're a policeman or a policewoman. If love is not present in your marriage, if this isn't primary in your dealings with your spouse, then you are employed in violence in your home. Employed. Perhaps not even seen. You don't see it. I'm not violent towards my wife. Listen, stop thinking you're right and receive correct instruction. You may not see this, but there is violence happening within the heart. And there's the Bible says and gives us this. This is the word of God that the spirit of all the members of your home are harmed when love does not reign in your marriage. Second thing out of that we just read, God says, take heed to your spirit. Therefore, divorce and love and marital problems and marital goodness. These are all spiritual issues. That's people, I got a call this week. Somebody, you know, wanting counseling, they're going to a counselor. I said, are they a Christian? They said, well, they're not a Christian. I said, I pray you do not go to that counselor. Don't go. Because they're not going to give you anything that's good. They're going to patch cracks on your walls you got to go to Christian counselors that make Christ the center of the things because they're spiritual issues. I don't really care if the problem is money. I'll tell you what, the, the, the two greatest problems in a marriage, you know what they are, right? Husband and wife? No, you're wrong. <laughs> number one is intimacy. That is the number one problem in a marriage. And number two is money. These are the two things that break marriages up constantly. So if the issue is money, if it's intimacy, if it's stress, if it's in-laws, let the list build. The issue is spiritual every time. Every time a marriage ends in divorce, it's a spiritual problem. Every time love is not present in the marriage, it's a spiritual, a spiritual problem. And the enemy knows that if he can ensure love does not reign in your marriage, then he can spiritually harm, he can take a spiritual sucker punch swing at the children. Which he absolutely does. Man, I, I hear people arguing about you know, their spouses all the time and, well, she doesn't do this or he doesn't do that. You know what? April never has to be good to me again. She's the best. She is wonderful. But I'll tell you this. She can absolutely be, be horrible to me for the rest of my life and I will protect my kids and stay with her because I know what it feels like. I've been there, been harmed, been sucker punched. The enemy absolu- absolutely loves to do that because the kids are absolutely innocent. And they are absolutely harmed. And it reminds him of the cross. Jesus, absolutely innocent on the cross. Absolutely harmed. Sucker punch. And it reminds him of that day. The enemy also knows that if he disrupts the family, then he can disrupt the church. Second part of what I said earlier. First Timothy 3, Paul gives the requirements. You might remember, he gives the qualifications for leadership within the church. He lays it out in the Bible and speaks of being a husband. Must be the husband of one wife, he says. Spiritual leadership in the church. A temperate leader in the home. Having his children in submission. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 says, For if a man does not know how to lead his own home, how will he take care of the church of God? And so the enemy knows if he can just take out the home, if he can take out the husband, if he can take out the parents, he can take the church out. Because now the church has to be something other than what the Bible has prescribed. If love reigns, however... 1 Corinthians love, 1 Corinthians 13, the love that is available to you, the love that you are capable of, the love that is given for you, waiting in the hands of the Savior for you, the love that predates sin. If love does reign, then everything is reversed. You're not suited in violence. Now you awake every day, woke to the mission, aware of your enemy, and yet winning. Have you ever gone into, I remember I used to wrestle, and wrestling is an interesting sport because it's the, one of the only sports where you're one-on-one. It's a team sport, but it's one-on-one. And the team lives or dies with your individual performance, right? I mean, I can have an off day on a basketball team, an off day on a football team, 
and, and, I, and my team can still win the game. But individually, and it's interesting, whenever I beat someone and then wrestled them again, there was no way I was going to lose. I never lost to anyone that I had beat before. I didn't lose much anyway, but I definitely would walk onto the mat knowing that that guy is afraid of me, that guy got pinned by me last time, that guy doesn't want to wrestle me, and I haven't put deodorant on for two days. <laughs> Tricks of the trade. <laughs> Tricks of the trade. I know it's pretty disgusting. Don't wash your shoulders, you get slippery, whatever. Um, anyway. And it's interesting, when, when love does reign, you wake up every day, and yes, the, the circumstance is still hard, but you know you're going to be all right. Yes, you had a bad night with her, it was bad yesterday with him, or we made mistakes, but it's going to be okay. You're winning, waking every day and putting on a suit of peace. Because that's the opposite of violence, peace. And so when love reigns in your home, when you strive for it, fight for it, protect it, can't do without it, lay down your life for it, then you're getting up every day and putting on a suit of peace for your wife, a suit of peace for your husband. Jesus said in John 14, 17, peace I leave with you, my peace, my peace I give to you. See, this is where you get that peace, husband, wife, future husband, future wife. This is where you get it. You get it from Jesus. Peace. You are not there to correct her. You are not there to make sure he is right in his walk with God. You are there to be an agent of peace in your home. Let God be God in their hearts. Let the Holy Spirit do his job. I'm not the Holy Spirit for April. Come on, man. Can you, can you imagine if April changes her life because of something I've, I've told her to do? Then who gets the glory? I get the glory. I would rather love her in the darkest of times and watch God work in her life. And then when she breaks free and breaks through and I get to see it and be a part of it, God will get the glory. That's foundation talk. If love reigns, then the children are secured. They are protected. They are provided for spiritually. Let me tell you this right now, guys. That is spiritual leadership. It is not barking Bible verses to correct behaviors in your home. Barking Bible verses? You ever use a Bible verse against your wife? You are Satan himself, bruh. Because he is the accuser of the brethren. It is not what we are to do. It is not what we ought to do. Ever. It is not the heart. It's not from the Lord. We are not to bark Bible verses to correct behaviors. But we walk with the Lord and we lead in love in our homes. That is spiritual leadership. There you go. Now you have a clear definition of how to lead your home spiritually. If love reigns, then the body of Christ fortifies. The body of Christ, this church, a church, will fortify. And then the enemy stands no chance, man. We've spent time going verse by verse through the chapter that puts love on display. And marriage is the single most God-designed, other-centered. Single most God-designed, other-centered union. Single most God-designed, others-centered union in the world. It is the place of primary application on this earth of the love we learn of in 1 Corinthians 13. And why would I say this earth? Because the primary, don't miss this Christians, please. The primary application of what we've learned in 1 Corinthians 13, where love ought to be applied, sought for, strived for, fought for, it ought to be a must have, is in your heart towards God. When God is silent in my life, Matt suffers long. See what I'm saying? This ought to be how we deal with God as well, because this is faith walking, is as we love God. Jesus said that we ought to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's primary. That's where love is primary. That's the foundation. And then we can love others as ourselves. Love must reign in your marriage. Love must reign in your homes. Or you're suited up to harm all that you love and all that the Lord is wanting to do through His church. I know that that is foundation talk. It's very high level, even theological in ways, doctrinal in application. Now let's go down to some practical things about marriage. The first thing you need to understand practically about marriage is that God did not create it for you to find happiness. It's a hard thing to hear. It's a hard thing to understand, especially you that are in, you know, betrothed or engaged and you just can't wait because things are so good. But love did not create marriage for you to find fulfillment. You're not going to find it there. If you look for it there, you're going to hold your husband or, to, or your wife to a standard that they can never meet. Fulfillment and happiness can only be found in your relationship with the Lord lest you make an idol out of your husband. Well, he doesn't make me happy. That's not his job. Is he, is he an idol? Happiness is very important in a marriage. It's wonderful. 
But you can get all you need from your relationship with the Lord. And you should. In fact, after you get married, get ready for the flesh to be greatly enhanced. Greatly enhanced. If you have a problem now, getting married will only serve to bring it to the surface. I always ask people as they're engaged and and we're meeting together, I say, do you guys fight? If they say yes, I'm like, whoa. You sure you guys want to get married? If you fight before you're married, do you know that it's about to step forward big time once you get married? It's not. It gets worse, right? It gets worse because now you got it. You can't. You got nowhere to go. That's it. I'm going home. Wait, wait we live together. <laughs> You've got nowhere to go. If you're unhappy now, if you're unfulfilled now, bless you. You will be the same as a wife, unhappy and unfulfilled. If you're unhappy and unfulfilled now as a man, you'll be the same as a husband. In fact, it will be multiplied. Here's a truth that I know you've never heard. Maybe you've never even thought of this. Satan never messed with man until man was married. Satan never messed with man. Why is it? Why is that? I'll show you why. I'll show you why in a minute. Why is it that Satan never messed with mankind until mankind came together with his wife? And he will indeed mess with you. He will exploit the vast differences between a man and a woman. The world out there will tell you there's no difference between a man and a woman. That is, look, I will not argue obvicity. Is obvicity a word? It sounds good. Things that are obvious, I won't argue with you. If you tell me that this isn't metal, I'm not going to sit here and argue that over you. you two, boys and girls have no differences. Why, am I, why would I even spend a minute arguing that with you? It's obvious. And the enemy exploits the differences between a man and a woman. Here's one example. A wife texts her husband, I got lost. The husband texts back, Where are you? That's already a problem. The wife texts back, In the car! They both break their phones, all right? <laughs> See, the, the differences are exploited because that's how... They, here's the wife... This just happened this, this week in April. I love you so much. Check this out. This is what happened. I texted April. Do we have any extra tickets to the Newsboys concert? Her response to me, do you want to go? That is not what I asked! <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I turned into the Incredible Hulk at home. <laughs> I'm so glad she's not there to see what I just did. You know? That's not what I asked you! You know? This is the differences between... All she was trying to do is to say, Hey, that great. Do you want to go? That's all she was trying to do. But that's not what I going to do. Do we have any tickets? Ah, this, yeah, whoo, okay. Let the testing begin. You will be tested in the flesh. You will be tested by the enemy in marriage. And you have to have a good foundation to be able to send back, no sweetheart, I don't want to go. Do we have any extra tickets? (laughs) Ask her again. And then you get upset because she doesn't text back in like three seconds. You're like, what is wrong? Give me an answer. (sighs) I'm sweaty. Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. It's funny. That really happened. Okay. And that, okay. Genesis chapter 1. Look at this. This is why. It's interesting. Why? What do we, if, if it's not, if marriage is not for happiness and fulfillment, what is it for? Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man. In his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Marriage was given to us by God that in it we would bear his image on earth. The primary reason for marriage, and, it, and this is original stuff, is that we would bear His image on earth. What is the image of God? 1 John 4, 8. God is love. God is love. Love is everything we learned in 1 Corinthians 13. It is unconditional. It is unrestricted. It is unlimited. It is unequivocal. And that is why divorce is not of God. It is foreign to His nature. This is why you cannot marry an unbeliever if you are a believer. The Bible strictly forbids it because you've got one party. If you're a believer and they're an unbeliever, now you have a party in the marriage that is not capable of the reason why marriage was even put in place. 
and it will not do well. You will have issues. Marriage, here's the first thing I talked about, I talk about, by the way, in premarital. The first thing, marriage is not a contract. Divorce is not of God, it is not of his nature, he hates it. Marriage is a covenant. Back to Malachi chapter 2. Keep your place in Genesis. Not hard to find that one, is it? Malachi chapter 2, verse 14 says uh, this. You, yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Covenant. The, the difference between a contract and a covenant is that there is no out. There is no out in a covenant. You and I have to think of marriage this way because this is indeed what it is. If you have a contract with your wife, you are not yet married to her. I encourage you to marry your wife today because it is a covenant. There is no out. This is a direct reflection of the image of God. Whether the old covenant or the new covenant, God gave himself no out. He gave himself no out. And not for a moment in all of history has he or has he been or will he ever turn. He is forever faithful. He has no out. That is a covenant. Marriage is not a deal between two people. It is a deal between you and God. That's what a vow is. What is marriage primarily designed to be? It is primarily designed to be a reflection, an image of the power of God, the love of God, and the faithfulness of God through His creation. That's the primary reason. Back to Genesis chapter 1. I'll show you a couple things to blow your mind, and then we'll be through. Chapter 1, back in Genesis chapter 1, look at verse 28. The next verse there says, Then God blessed them. I love this. And He said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. And you're like, Yes, that is a blessing. I'm sorry. He said, said, God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and multiply, fill the earth. Marriage is the primary avenue that God has ordained on earth for the proliferation of His image. Not the church. This is going to blow you away. The church is not the primary place where God's image should be proliferated in society. It's marriage. Marriage says there, made in the image of God for the proliferation. Offspring and lineage are not to preserve your name. They are given, the design from the beginning is that they are to preserve the name of God. And you say, well, that doesn't even make sense. Why do you think God refers to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because that is how he reveals himself. Through the generations, to the generations. And if the enemy can kill the agapeo, if he can kill the love in a marriage, then he can kill the lineage, the proliferation of his image. And if he does that, he stops the gospel. We got so many churches, but people are starving for the gospel. Why is that? Because the gospel doesn't proliferate through the church primarily. It proliferates through the children of godly marriages. We wonder how the world has gotten so far off. It's because the husbands and wives of the church have gotten so far off. And generations that do not worship God are coming out of church families. And it starts with kids slurping slurpees. I mean, it starts with no boundaries, no accountability. Even at, Well, my kid's only three years old. But your hand fits better when they're three. Mm, you know, you, you've got no boundaries, no discipline, no proliferation of what is right and what is true. And so you have God-fearless children. They don't fear God, they don't worship God, and they're coming out of church families. When the reason that God has made, even made marriage is so that His image might be proliferated. In marriage, you need to establish your home. Genesis 2.24 says, A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. You know the Bible never says a woman shall leave his father and mother and be joined to her husband? You know why? Because she never leaves. The husband is to go and to make, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the role of the husband. You are to make the life. I'm going to just give you this, and this is going to be a, a precursor to the next time. Husband, you are ultimately accountable and responsible for the health of your marriage. You, not her. You are accountable and responsible to God for the health of your marriage. No one else. No one else. Only you. Don't tell me what she does and doesn't do. Look at what the church did and didn't do. Jesus went to the cross, fixed it all. So don't give me that. And we'll, we'll go over that. We're, we're ahead of it. I'll give you another one. I'll give you another one. You want to marry my daughter? Check it out. You better be, better, you better be able to do a better job with her than I can. Because that's the requirement of marrying my daughter. So good luck. <laughs> that's the requirement. Because a man shall leave his father and mother. Not the woman. Not the girl. She's staying with me forever. Okay. Okay. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You ought to close the circle, seal your home. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Is that true? 
in your home, including your dealings with your spouse. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. And your priorities of your schedule with your children. If you neglect, I want you to know this, and I want you to hear this, it's hard to hear. Neglect the whole world before you neglect the children and the need for their spiritual health. You say whatever, he's going to be the next NBA star. That's exactly what Satan would want. It's for him to be the NBA star that doesn't proliferate the image of God. And you say, well, there are NBA stars that proliferate. Yeah, one in a million. Okay, so don't get, don't fight, fight me with that. You're fighting a toothpick and I've got uh, a tomahawk. You know, so, all right, let's battle, you know. These are the tenets of a godly marriage, these practical things I've given you. I'm going to give you a, f- a few bite-sized steaks. You know those steaks you get? They're small, they're wrapped in bacon. Oof. Let me give you a couple of those before we close. Ben, you can come up. Listen, I'm going to give you a couple of these. Don't forget these. Write them down if you can keep up. You can have control with your spouse in your marriage, or you can have connection, but you can't have both. 1 Corinthians 13.5 says, Love doesn't seek its own. So you can control him. You can try to control her. But if you do that, you'll never connect. So give it up. Give it up. Even if you're right. You know, people say, well, the wives should submit to the husbands. Yeah. Okay. In my home, we submit to the Holy Spirit. And if I'm not submitted to Christ, I don't expect her to submit to me. And if she's submitted to Christ, I submit to her. Period. Forgiveness is strong. Love is stronger. 1 Peter 4.8 says a wonderful thing. I don't, do we have 1 Peter 4, 8? Oh, I haven't marked. For the sake of time, check this out. Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. That word for cover means love hides the knowledge of a thing. That's what it means. And therefore, if you love, forgiveness need not be applied. If you're holding out for forgiveness, you know, I want an apology from him. Look, if you love him, forgiveness need not be applied. Love is long-suffering. Love is not provoked. Love bears and endures all things. These are the four rings of marriage. Engagement, engagement ring, the wedding ring, suffering, <laughs> and enduring. God never blesses compromise. That's contract talk. Compromise is a contract. God will always bless sacrifice. Because when sacrifice is perceived, if April perceives that I'm sacrificing for her, then mercy arrives. Mercy will arrive in her heart. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 13, Go and learn what this means, Matt. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, as I sacrifice for my spouse, that's what welcomes and ignites the love in her heart for me. And as she sacrifices for me and I perceive that, then all I want to do, it's in both hearts, I just want to give her mercy. Here's some go-dos as we leave today. If you're married today, or if you're thinking about getting married, if you're single, erase divorce from your thought file. Erase it. Erase it. Factory reset. Back before sin. Erase it. Erase it from your option list. Erase it from your word bank. Erase it. Compliment your spouse. Leave out of here. Don't you dare go a week and not compliment your spouse. Create pleasurable interactions with and for your spouse. Create them for her. Create them for him. I love to talk great about April when she's not around because then when she comes around, there's a pleasurable interaction between who I've been talking to about her because they automatically think she's great, which she is. Focus on appreciating your spouse as you leave out of here. Say, I love you. Stop saying, love you. Say, I love you. Stop saying, love you. Say, I love you. It's so much deeper than love you. Say, I love you. After being apart, for any length of time, more than an hour or so, always greet your spouse with affection. You don't have to do these things, and you can have cracks in your walls. That's for you, not for me. That's for me and my house. We shall serve the Lord. Always, and remember, if you get upset with Him, if you're fed up with Him, if you're fed up with her, it's not their fault. It's God's. He's the one that brought you together. It's His fault. Take it to Him. Let love lead your marriage. Let love reign. Fix the foundation. The cracks the cracks are just going to be gone they won't happen any longer Father I do pray that your image God would be reflected in the marriages in our church God that as we walk with you and are sanctified by you God you would do that work in us and I I know that today might have been hard to hear things that are very convicting even condemning towards you listen you're not condemned go and he said to the to the lady man caught in the very act of it i'm caught in the very act of not doing these things in my heart of hearts all the time with april he said go and sin no more so go out from here and 
um, seek the Lord. If you need prayer, we're here for you. If you want to receive Jesus, I am not unconditionally love my wife. Well, you need Jesus. You're not going to do it without that, without your relationship and intact with Jesus. You need to have hope that you have eternal life. You need to have that hope in you. If you don't have that hope in you, then no wonder you're always down, angry. No wonder you're always stressed. Because there's no hope there. Your eternal life. You need to know Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the name under heaven by which all men must be saved. If you'd like to receive him, we're up here for you as well. Father, we love you. If you like today's message or were blessed by it, be sure to like and subscribe now and become part of our community. Also, help spread the great news of Jesus Christ by sharing this message on your social media accounts like Facebook, Instagram, so that your friends and family can be blessed as well.